An emissions emergency. How filling up your car could be fueling a rise in early deaths. From car companies to public policy, we'll examine the dirty truth about diesel. I'm Martin Stanford. This is Inside. Welcome to Insight. When Volkswagen was caught cheating lab tests in America, it not only created a crisis for the car maker, it also focused attention on the dangers of diesel. In the year that's followed, it's been claimed that very few vehicles from any car maker meet emission limits when you drive them in the real world. And in that real world, the pollutants are helping fuel a public health emergency that the World Health Organization says leads to millions of premature deaths. Insight's Tig Enright has our main report. If you had to guess how cars are tested for emissions, this is probably what you'd imagine. Hook it up to testing equipment and take it out for a spin. But it doesn't happen this way, certainly not in Europe. Road tests like this are not required by EU law. And when these road testers put all the diesel cars on sale right now through their paces, the results were startling. So how many of the cars you tested actually met the limits when they're out on the road? Eight. Of all the diesels we tested, eight. Out of about 800 cars. And how much worse were they than the, the standards allow? On average, four times the, the legal limit. So 80 milligrams per kilometre is the legal limit for diesels. We're seeing over 300 milligrams per kilometre on average. Among the worst pollutants were the diesel engines of Fiat's and Suzuki's, emitting 15 times more nitrogen oxide than European limits. Renault-Nissan diesels were measured at 14 times the limit and Opel Vauxhall at 10 times. Well, these breaches of the limits are all perfectly legal because the standards say that emissions must only fall within them when cars are being tested in the laboratory and not outside in the real world. It was the reliance on laboratory testing that shone a light on emissions limits during the Volkswagen scandal last year, when the German car maker was found to have been manipulating lab results. Testing VWs on the road today produces rather different results. In fact, the, the one manufacturer who has cars that do regularly meet the legal limit is Volkswagen. Incredible. Which, incredible. Given the whole story, you wouldn't expect that. So why does road testing produce such different results to testing in the laboratory? It's a very gentle one. Relatively low speeds, low acceleration rates, no hills. But also in Europe, we found lots of issues in terms of grey areas and loopholes uh, that can be exploited. If, if you are trying to get the best possible number, uh, there are things you can do within the law to get a better number. The emissions in question here are nitrogen oxide, or NOx. It's a gas emitted by all engines, but at a much higher level by diesels. Previously, diesels were hailed for their fuel efficiency. Travelling further in a single tank meant that carbon dioxide emissions were lower. But now we know that diesels emit a lot more NOx, which is another serious public health hazard. Our system of laboratory testing is, is completely obsolete and irrelevant. Uh, thankfully, there are new road tests which will be coming in in the next few years. But we also need to make sure that the manufacturers don't find ways of manipulating and distorting the test results. It is possible to filter NOx before it's released, but the systems are problematic. The manufacturers are actually switching off the after-treatment systems on the exhausts under most driving conditions. Uh, this is because uh, if they didn't, the engines would break down. So what we need to do is to recall these vehicles. There's 29 million cars on Europe's roads that could be cleaned up. That would be a very dramatic recall. Do you think it's actually going to happen? I think it is going to happen. I think there's now a lot of pressure uh, coming from the European Commission to require 
the member states of the EU to enforce the legislation that's there. The American standards are the ones that are hard to meet. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, BMW, Mercedes, who export diesel cars to America, meet those limits. It can be done. Technology exists to clean up the knocks from these cars. And that's the problem with the European regulations is it's not forced the manufacturers to deploy those technologies. Tens of millions of cars are on our roads, polluting a lot more than we previously realised. Now we know that, what we don't know is if anything will happen to fix them and put a stop to their pollution. Ty Genwright, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by Peter Campbell. He's the motor industry correspondent at the Financial Times and also with us, the award-winning environmental journalist, Fiona Harvey. Welcome to you both. Um, Peter, since the scandals, the sales of diesel cars have fallen, in some cases quite dramatic. Is the industry in panic? I think it would be uh, an exaggeration to say the industry is in panic. Diesel sales have certainly fallen. They've been falling since about 2011. Um, part of that is a relation to the VW scandal. What we've seen is the sales decline that's been going on since 2011 has accelerated in the last year. Consumers are clearly turning against diesel and thinking twice about buying these cars in the future because of all the public health worries that have come out and been brought to light by this scandal. And do you think, Fiona, that the motoring industry is taking the current predicament and the allegations of such severe polluting powers of a diesel engine seriously? Well, it's a bit late for a start for them to take it seriously, but I don't think they're really taking it seriously enough because the real truth here um, is that we should not have diesel cars on the roads in our cities, full stop. And that's a very difficult future for the car industry to face up to as they've put so much investment into diesel cars over the, over the years. You said cities, and I think deliberately, because it's the concentration of exhaust fumes that's the problem. If you use diesels in the countryside or in less um, concentrated areas, the problem is la largely mitigated, isn't it? A lot of people in rural areas would argue that they need uh, diesel vehicles and that they are uh, more fuel efficient, they're more practical. Uh, people in, in rural areas often tend to have multi-purpose vehicles, so they might be bigger. Um, and if they were, were running on petrol, they would be very expensive. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. It's really the concentration uh, that is the problem here. It's also the way that the fumes from diesel react with various other chemicals in the air. Um, so it's in cities that we're seeing the deaths um, and the effects on people's respiratory tracts, on their breathing. Um, so it's very difficult to um, have a car that, that you say it can only go in certain areas, it can only go in the countryside or it can only go in the city. Mm. Um, but there are ways of managing this. Um, there are ways of, for instance, uh, penalising uh, diesel drivers who choose to come into urban areas. Um, and there are ways of uh, adjusting the taxation system so that rural drivers perhaps uh, do not lose out. So it's not but unmanageable. You could just say, everybody who comes into a city has got to have an electric car, but maybe that's a little few, roads, a few years down the, down the path here. Um, Peter, as you see it, we've got this twin problem, the, the CO2, increase in CO2, which is a problem from, from other sources of uh, power and fuel and everything else, and then these nitrogen or NOx, this lethal combination of NO2 and NO, yeah. uh, nitrous oxide. Which is the greater problem, do you think, for the manufacturers to have to address? Well, nitrogen oxide is, uh, is actually poisonous and has been linked by the World Health Organization to serious respiratory conditions. Right. Um, CO2, we kind of all know about that. And, and the reason, people forget the reason diesel has taken off so much in Europe, it hasn't really taken off anywhere else in the world. It's a European because, phenomenon. It's a European it? phenomenon. Half of all cars sold in Europe are diesel. Uh, and the reason for that is that Europe has such tight CO2 regulations, all the manufacturers have turned to diesel as the solution because diesel cars um, produce around 20 to 30 percent less CO2 than their petrol equivalents. Right. Um, so on the global warming argument, we've got to do something about CO2, dump your petrol car, go and buy a diesel car. Absolutely. It was seen as the solution to the CO2 problem. But there was a but. There was a but and that was the NOx, the nitrogen oxides. Um, gases which are very dangerous, which are very harmful. And there were various technologies, as we saw in the report, available to manufacturers to try and clean this up. Um, and they work, don't they? Or do they just work in theory? They work, they do work, but they're expensive and uh, sometimes they affect the performance of the car. And the issue that VW faced was that there's a, 
um, a solution you have to put into the car called Add Blue Urea, which uh, removes a lot of the diesel fumes. And consumers would have to go and top that up as well as topping up their diesel. Now, VW didn't want them to have to do that that often. They wouldn't want them to have to take their cars in an extra time to get it filled up. They thought it was a hassle. They thought it would hurt their sales. So the one of the reasons they bought in this cheating software was in order to prevent them having to put Add Blue in some of the tanks. And, uh, and so that was one of the options, and they just decided they weren't going to go for it. They went for an alternative technology that wasn't as effective and that other manufacturers didn't think would work. Uh, Fiona, why not just insist? We've got the technology that can work. Why not just insist, and if legislate if you have to, that this better technology or the original technology is applied to all diesel vehicles? You could do Solution. that. You could do that, and there are standards uh, that uh, come from the European Union that are intended to, uh, to ameliorate these problems, to take away some of these emissions um, in the way that Peter's been describing. However, um, these take a long time to phase in, typically, um, partly because uh, the European Commission doesn't want to be accused of being an anti-industry, so they don't want to do things that the car industry would then say, oh, you know, this is incredibly expensive, you're ruining us, we're going to cut lots of jobs, you know, this is dreadful. Because, you know, the car industry is a big industry in, in Europe, um, and you have to balance out the, uh, the needs of the car industry with the needs of people. Um, in my view, we've gone too far in giving leeway to the car industry without paying enough attention to actual deaths, premature deaths, and the fact that uh, people are suffering respiratory problems because of this, and in fact children are being really harmed because if a child's lungs are damaged early in its life, that child never recovers, even when it's right. an adult, it's, it's still damage, harmed, it? it's irreparable um, damage. Peter, why do you think the car lobby, the manufacturers, have so much power, particularly over governments then, or, or over public sentiment? Well, it, it, it shifts from country to country. The biggest example is Germany, where um, manufacturing uh, of cars is an absolutely colossal industry, um, a huge exporter, a huge source of revenue for the German government. And, uh, and they're huge employers. Uh, they employ you know, tens and tens of thousands of, of workers uh, in Germany, which is not normally somewhere you'd choose to, to locate manufacturing plants otherwise, because labor costs are very high. VW, even last week, said it was going to lay off 30,000 people over the next few years in order to try and reduce its cost base so that it can invest in electric cars in the future. The, um, the lobbying power of uh, the car industry to governments is, uh, it almost can't be overstated, it's absolutely colossal, which is one of the reasons why, as we've seen, you know, uh, regulators are, are so reluctant to clamp down on these. But one more thing that's important to note is that part of the decline in diesel is not necessarily uh, in reaction to the VW scandal. They were falling anyway, and manufacturers are going to have to meet new emissions targets that are coming into force at the end of the decade, and yep. they're going to have to comply with real-world driving cycles. And these are really difficult to make work in smaller cars. They're incredibly the difficult. The sort of family yeah. runarounds that a lot of us use, um, that's difficult to fix. And most manufacturers are expecting diesels to die out completely from small family cars. I talked to the boss of VW in Paris a few weeks ago, and he was saying that he thinks a diesel engine will cost 2,000 euros more at 2020 than it does today, just because of the sheer engineering they need to put in it to meet regulatory targets. Well, that makes diesel unaffordable when compared to a petrol car of that size. Brief thought, Fiona. Do you think it's a boost for the electric car industry, all this? It's an opportunity, isn't it? Well, we've been waiting a long time for boosts and opportunities for the electric car industry. Um, the electric car industry has taken a while to get to the point where it has... Here's a moment. Get its act together and you've got an open market. You've got an open goal. You can. Before, yes, but electric cars, they, I mean, they are still uh, expensive to buy, um, which is a, a problem for many people. Um, again, we should have much better tax systems that favour electric cars. We're getting the infrastructure Really, electric cars do have an opportunity. Let's talk about that incentivising of consumers in just a moment. This is Insight. Coming up, we take a closer look at just how toxic our global cities have become.